Well, good morning. My name is Jeremiah. I'm one of the pastors here at Westbridge, and it's awesome to see so many of you here with us. I want to say hello to those of you who are joining us online as well. Thanks for participating with us through that venue. And to kick things off, Merry Christmas. We're heading into this series uh, where it is this time of year. And so we're kicking off a series today, but just to get things warmed up. I have a couple of questions. Uh, I want to know, and if you're watching online, put an exclamation point uh, in the chat just so that we know that uh, that's how you're going to raise your hand on this. First of all, I want to know how many of you are completely planners, you're totally organized, and you have all of your Christmas shopping already done? Hands nice and high. Anybody? (laughs) Okay. In the chat, put an exclamation point. Uh, How about this? How many of you are at the other end of the spectrum and your plan is to swing into a drugstore on Christmas Eve? Okay. Well, thank you for your honesty. Wow. Many more than I would have anticipated. All right. How many of you would say you just have two gifts left to get? Just two. Okay. All right. That's fair. How many of you, you're on that last one. You just got to find that one more, one more gift. Anybody? How many of you are still, you're just on the hunt, you're just searching for that perfect gift to get your pastor? Any, anybody? Okay. All right, I'll just uh, double check in. Well, regardless of where you're at on the gift buying spectrum, we actually provide a service here at Westbridge Church every year. Uh, it's kind of a tradition for us that when we head into Christmas, this is a service that we provide to you. It's free of charge, and uh, we help you with Christmas ideas. And we're here for inspiration. And so every year we bring you what we think will be some phenomenal gifts. And these are things that you can buy online and they'll get shipped to you before Christmas. And the first one is this incredible uh, 12,000 piece jigsaw puzzle. It's fantastic. You'll notice it's all one color, except for (laughs) there is a moon. There is a half of a moon. And the title of this is called Majestic Moon, which I think is lovely. And uh, this is a gift that you can give to family and friends. I love the descriptions on this. It says, drive your friend or loved one to the point of madness with this 12,000 piece jigsaw puzzle. They'll struggle until they go blind trying to complete the puzzle called Majestic Moon. It's lovely. Now, some of you, I know you have kids, so we want to help you with that area as well. This is a great one for kids. This is called P is for pterodactyl. Which basically breaks every rule of phonics, right? It says, ensure your child struggles in life by setting a terrible foundation of the alphabet with the worst alphabet book ever made. This painful, painfully fun read humorously addresses mischievous words that ignore the rules of phonetics and spelling. Now, another great kid's gift, if you're not looking in the more academic realm, this falls more into science, I guess you'd say. This is the um, <laughs> My First Fire Kit. It says, keep Junior busy and entertained while you're occupied with more important matters by letting him go wild with the My First Fire starting kit. Boredom, get ready to meet your match. Because where there is smoke, there is a guaranteed good time. So don't say that we've never done anything to inspire you here at Westbridge. Uh, Here's another one. This one I love. Again, it's a kid's gift. This is where you can actually put your face onto the head of a Lego guy. That's fantastic. Your kids can be playing Legos, and you're just like looking up at them. It's amazing. And so you can actually convert friends and family into Lego form using this personalized 3D printing service. You just submit two photos of yourself. They put it onto a Lego person and send it back to you. Phenomenal gift for anybody who wants to have you in Lego form. And finally, for, uh, we don't want to miss those of you who are uh, bakers and chefs and cooks, the ones who are preparing the Christmas meal. We're so thankful for you. So we got this for you. Treat your taste buds to a delectable treat from Snoop Dogg's cookbook. Uh, anytime the munchies strike. <laughs> Couldn't resist. <laughs> it's packed with 50 mouth-watering recipes from the dog father himself, including fried bologna sandwiches and baked mac and cheese. Did someone groan at fried bologna sandwiches? I'll have you know, I grew up on fried bologna sandwiches and they're delicious, okay? <laughs> so... There you go. That is our list for this year, and we want you to be inspired. And so you can uh, get any of these on the website, thisiswhyimbroke.com, and they will send them to you for Christmas. All right. Now, today we're starting a series for December, and uh, I love I, I love these series that we do in December, but the difficult part of doing a Christmas series is the Christmas story, because... 
Everybody's familiar with the Christmas story. How do you retell the story of Christmas in a way that it hasn't been told so many times before? Because for so many of us, we've heard the Christmas story so many times before that it starts to feel like white noise. It starts to feel like uh, a, little, a little bit like, man, I've heard this before, like wah, wah, we've heard this, you know, so many times. And so uh, today we're going to launch into this series called Godspell. We're going to dig into that in a minute. And to be honest with you, for a lot of people, and maybe you're one of these people, maybe you're here today because a friend invited you, maybe you're engaging online with us, uh, maybe you're watching it later in the week. And maybe you're one of these people who you've kind of kept God at arm's distance. You've kind of resisted Christianity or you've had some objections to faith and you have a reason for keeping God at arm's distance. And maybe uh, I think that it's easy to resist Christianity sometimes because the question that you've wondered and the question that has kept you from fully buying into Christianity is the question, is it true? Is Christianity true? And, and so if that's you and you don't believe the story of Jesus and, you, and you, you're not buying into the whole Jesus thing, my guess is that you have a very good reason to not buy into that. Because I, maybe I don't even know you, but my guess would be that you're a, a relatively intelligent person and that whatever objections you have for not believing in Jesus are probably really good and valid reasons. For a lot of people, though, the question is, did Jesus really exist? Did Jesus really do the things that he's, that he's claimed to have done? Did, did, did he really live? Did he really die? Did he really rise from the dead? Is it true? And the thing with that question, is it true, is that when you ask it, you have to really drill down on what is the it that you're asking, is it true? And I think for most people, the it in the question, is it true, isn't necessarily just is, is Jesus real or is Christianity real, but it is the Bible. And that's unfortunate because there were tens of thousands of followers of Jesus before there was ever a Bible. In fact, the Bible did not create Christianity. It's much better than that. People follow Jesus not because the Bible says so. It's much better than that because followers of Jesus for 350 years didn't have a Bible to tell them so. There were tens of thousands of followers of Jesus before there ever was a Bible. In fact, it's the other way around. People started following Jesus because he rose from the dead. They started following Jesus because they saw him alive, and then they saw him rise again, and then they began to document and write about the things that they had seen and the things that they had heard and the things that they had experienced. And so for many people today, a bigger question than is it true actually becomes this. Is it good? Is it even good? Is it good for the world? Is it good for my life? Is it good for my kids? Is it good for my family? Is it good for society? Is it good? And even if it's true, is it good? Now think about this. When you hear something that's not good, don't you hope that it's not true? When you hear something that's not good, your initial reaction typically, as is just human instinct, would be like, man, I hope that's not true. Like, for instance, when you hear that Netflix is doubling their monthly subscription, It's not good. You go, man, I hope that's not true. Or if you heard that uh, Amazon was going to go back to selling only books and nothing else, you'd be like, oh, I hope that's not true. That's not good. I hope that's not true. For some of you, you'd be like, oh, that is really good. (laughs) Like the Amazon driver knows me, greets me by name personally. This is really sad. But when you, when something, when you hear something that's not good, you hope that it's not true. And the opposite is also true. When you hear something that's good, you hope that it's true. And you don't know if it's true, but when you hear something that you think sounds good, your natural instinct is to hope that it's true. For instance, what if you came across a study that said that um, processed sugar extends life expectancy? You'd be like, man, I don't know if that's true or not, but I hope it's true. (laughs) It might be the greatest clickbait ever created, but man, I hope that's true. Right? And just because you hope it's true doesn't make it true. But the fact that you see it as good news doesn't make it true. But here's the point. When you hear something that's good, you want it to be true. Even before you find out if it's true or not. You want it to be true. And when the birth of Jesus was first announced, you have to know the way that it was announced was, this is good news. This is good news that will bring great joy And here's the part that nobody could believe in the moment that this announcement was made. This will bring great joy for all people. You're talking about a civilization and a culture and a society that was so divided because of the Roman Empire and you had people living in in, 
Jewish uh, in Israel, and, and they were practicing Judaism. And the division surrounding all of that between the Roman Empire and the temple and all the things that were taking place. And the announcement is made that this is good news and that it will bring great joy. And this is the hard part to believe that will be for all people. That means it will, it will bring great joy. When people hear this news, it will bring great joy to Jews. It will bring great joy to Romans. It will bring great joy to the poor. It will bring great joy to the rich. Anybody and everybody from here on out, from this moment forward, when they hear this news, it will bring great joy to all people. And so the message of Jesus would be good news for everybody. And so here's the question. Was it actually good news? And if it is, if this message of Jesus is actually as good of news as the angels originally declared it to be, why do people resist it? Why do people resist if it's such good news? Because it's human nature when you hear that something is good that you want it to be true. So why is it that people resist Christianity? If people hope that good news is true, then why isn't everybody in our world hoping that this message is true even before they discover that it is? In fact, the original version of this wasn't even called the Bible. The original version of this was called the Gospel. And it's where we get the title of our series, Godspell. It's two, two old English words put together, Godspell. And that eventually became Gospel. And it's how they interpret it. it. It literally means good story or good news. And so they said, hey, when the, when the angels first came and they declared this thing that was going to take place in our world, they called it good news. So let's call it good news. And it got translated to Godspell, and eventually in our English language became gospel. But really, it just means this is good news. And so from the very beginning, in the very first century, when this whole idea first touched down on planet Earth, it was introduced as good news that would bring great joy for all people. And this message caught on, because when you hear something that's good, you want it to be true. When you hear something that is good, you want it to be true. And what breaks my heart in our world today, so many people are leaning away from the message of Jesus. So many people are leaning away from the message of Christianity. So many people are leaning away from the message that Jesus came to bring good news. Because somehow, somewhere along the way, they came to the conclusion that this message is not good news. Somewhere along the way, they came to the conclusion that this isn't as good of news as I thought it would be. And if you're one of those people, the reason that you've come to that conclusion is because somewhere along the way, you bumped into someone or you interacted with some version of Christianity that wasn't anything like the original. You bumped into some version of Christianity that didn't have anything to do with the original, but the original was absolutely compelling. In fact, Luke records for us something that Jesus said. In Luke chapter 16, this is Jesus talking to a group of people, and he says, until John the Baptist, the law of Moses and the message of the prophets were your guides. He's talking to Jewish people. And he says, for you, up until the time when John the Baptist came and up until the time that I stepped onto the shores of the River Jordan and up until the time that, uh, that I was baptized by John the Baptist, the law of Moses and the prophets, those were the things that guided you. And then he continues, but now, now there's something new happening, but now the good news of the kingdom of God is preached and everyone is eager to get in. They're eager to get in because it's good news. Jesus says, now there's good news. The kingdom of God is here. I mean, the don't get me wrong, Jesus says, the law of Moses and the prophets, they did their job to get you up to this point. But now God is doing something new, and it's good news. And it's good news for everybody. And it's not just good news for Jewish people. It's good news for everybody. And when people discover what it is, they are eager to get in. They want to be a part of it, even if they're not convinced that it's true. But when they understand what Jesus came to offer, and when they understand what God is like, they want to be a part of it. If the life and teaching and the message of Jesus doesn't strike you as good news, if that doesn't hit you as good news, it's possible that the version that you interacted with or some version that you were introduced to isn't the original. Because the original version was absolutely compelling. And the original version was worth telling. Now, when you think about the number of writings that we have of the life of Jesus, when you think about 
how many stories and accounts we have of his life, of his teachings, of his death and resurrection. We have Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. We have four different accounts of the life and teachings and death and resurrection of Jesus. And when you think about how difficult that must have been, because they didn't have computers, they didn't have printing press, you couldn't make copies, everything was copied on a scroll, uh, letter by letter, word by word, sentence by sentence, meticulously by hand, by scribes that would copy one to the next. And so when you think about the fact that we have four separate accounts of the life and teachings and death and resurrection of Jesus, we have more written about Jesus than we have from any other human being in that era in history. It's fascinating. And when you think about that, the only stories that we have from people from that era were stories from rich people. And the only reason that somebody would have a story written about them is because they were very wealthy and they would hire someone to write their biography. And it would be a very painstaking and difficult task. And so they would hire someone to write their biography. That person would write their biography. And even most of those, you know, 99% of those that were written didn't survive antiquity. We don't have copies of those. And so you look at this and the fact that we have all of these stories of Jesus is absolutely fascinating. In fact, Luke tells us when he starts his account, here's what he says to us. Luke 1 verse 1, he says, Many people, many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us. Luke says, look, I'm going to write an account of Jesus. I'm going to, I'm going to write it out and I'm going to investigate and I'm going to put it all together. But you need to know I'm not the only one. Many people have set out to write about these things that have been fulfilled among us. There's all kinds of accounts floating around here. You need to know I'm not the only one. Now think about this. How many people will write about your life? How many people, when you have lived and died and your life is over here on this earth, how many people will sit down and investigate what did they do and what did they say and what was their life like and work hard to put together your life in writing, even though it's so much easier to do today? I know the answer to that question. You know how many people will do that for you? Not many. And not many people will do that for me. It's fascinating. We should be able to do that so much easier today. Why would so many people write about the accounts of this guy from Nazareth, from Judea, who traveled for a few short years, who never owned any property and never wrote any books and never became famous and died a horrible death? Why, why so many accounts? It's because something significant happened. But not just something significant. It's also because something good happened. Something good happened. See, I don't know what version of Christianity you were first introduced to. I don't know what that looks like for you, but in the first century, the version that they were first introduced to was good. I mean, it was so good that they were compelled to document what they saw and what they heard and what they experienced. They recognized what has taken place in our lifetime is so good. We cannot let this just not be told. We've got to tell the story. And so they wanted it to be true even before they were convinced that it was. And so Luke continues. He says, so many have set out to write accounts. They used the eyewitness reports circulating among us from the early disciples. Having carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I also have decided to write an account for you, most honorable Theophilus, so you can be certain of the truth of everything you were taught. Now, we don't know who Theophilus is. We know that Luke writes to him in Luke. We also know that Luke is the author of, uh, in our, what we call our New Testament, the book of Acts, and that he starts off writing to Theophilus this letter. Both of these are written to this guy, Theophilus, who is more, more than likely a, a wealthy Roman citizen who has become a follower of Jesus. And Luke says, I'm... You, so many people have written these accounts, Theophilus. So many people have written these things and you've read them and you've become a follower of Jesus. And so I just want to put together an account for you. And I've investigated all of the other accounts and I've read them and I've talked to the eyewitnesses. I've talked to the disciples of Jesus. I've talked to those who knew him and saw him. And I have put together a detailed account for you. And Theophilus, here's why I've done that. Because I want you to be certain of the truth of everything that you were taught. 
I want you to come to this understanding so we can be secure in the knowledge of the things that we've been taught. And little did Luke know that this one account that he was going to write to this one individual would be one of the four accounts of the life and teachings and death and resurrection of Jesus that would survive antiquity. And so we have it. Why was this story worth telling? It was worth telling because it was good news. It was good news. And while the angels were the first ones to announce that it was good news, people didn't experience it as good news until Jesus showed up on the scene. Until he showed up at the edge of the Jordan River to be baptized by John the Baptist and begin to preach and teach and show this is what the kingdom of God is like. If you wonder what God is like, you look at me, Jesus would say, because I'm going to show you what this God is like. In fact, Luke tells us this story. And this is such good news because it was the news that God wasn't out to get you. And maybe you even grew up with a version of Christianity like that or you were introduced to a version of Christianity like that where it reads a lot like Santa Claus is coming to town, you know. And you, you better not shout and you better not cry and you better not pout. And I'm telling you why. Because Jesus is coming to town and he's making a list and he's checking it twice. And you're on the naughty list, you know. Shame, shame, shame. And if that's the version of Christianity that you grew up with, you need to know. That's why this original version was such good news. Because the version that Jesus introduced to the world was that God came to rescue you from the things that were holding you captive. That's really good news for a first century Jewish person who's stuck somewhere between a Roman Empire and the religious temple the law of Moses and all of its regulations. And what you had was, was these two powers. You had the Roman Empire, and, and they basically said to this little nation of Israel, you worship whatever God you want to, just don't try to overthrow Caesar. You do your thing, or just live and let live. But you, you raise a finger to come against the Roman Empire, and you will experience the weight and the might of the Roman Empire. And later on, that's exactly what would happen. And so in Jesus' day, you have people who are followers of the law of Moses. But the Pharisees, the religious leaders, exploited that system and made it so burdensome on people at the, so that they could become wealthy at the people's expense. And so your options as a first century Jewish person were be on the outs with the Roman Empire or be on the outs with the temple. And either way, there was not a good option. You, you felt captive either way. And that's why this is such good news. That's why when Jesus comes onto the scene, he says, look, the kingdom of God, it's brand new. This is good news because it's, it's here to set you free from the things that are holding you captive. That's very disruptive for the Pharisees. It's very disruptive for those that were profiting off of the exploitation of a certain system. And so Luke tells us this story that, that shows us what good news this is. He tells us in Luke chapter 5 that Jesus went to a wealthy man's house and he's teaching and Jesus has gained some notoriety. People are starting to follow him. He's doing miracles. He's healing people. And so he goes into this guy's house and he's teaching. And in fact, the crowd starts to gather. So many people fill the house. They're starting to flood out the door and into the street. They're craning their necks just to try to hear what Jesus is saying from inside the house. And in the middle of his teaching, suddenly there's sunlight coming through the roof. And people kind of look up and strain their eyes and they're looking and parts of the tile of the roof are starting to be peeled away. And I'm sure that the guy who's hosting it, who owns the house, is thinking, oh man, why did I agree to host this party? <laughs> it's getting pretty wild in here, you know? And the Pharisees are following Jesus because they're thinking to themselves, okay, we've got to keep a, a, sharp, a sharp eye on this guy because he says things that are so disruptive. And if we're not careful, he's going to disrupt our whole system. And in fact, later on, they actually say that. We've got, to, we've got to do something about this Jesus because if this continues, everybody's going to believe. Why? Because it's such good news. And they're following Jesus and they're seeing what he's going to say. And suddenly the light gets blocked out and a massive mat gets lowered and people come to realize there are four guys on the roof and their faces are peering down and they're actually lowering someone down into the house. And the man who's on the mat is paralyzed. And everybody's holding their breath. Everybody's sitting on the edge of their seat. They're kind of waiting. What is Jesus going to say? What is Jesus going to do? No one's ever done this before. And Jesus looks at the man. And this is what he says. Luke records it for us in Luke chapter 5. He says, this is Jesus talking to this man. He says, young man, your sins are forgiven. 
And I don't know what the young man was thinking, maybe something along the lines of, thank you, that is not why I'm here. I don't know if you can see what I got going on here, right? And Luke records this for us. Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. But the Pharisees and the teachers of religious law said to themselves, who does he think he is? That's blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. And that is exactly the point that Jesus was making. And they're thinking to themselves, you can't just uh, announce that someone's forgiven. We've got a system for that, right? We've got, we've got steps in place. You want to get to God, you got to go through us. And we've got some steps in place, and you've got to, you know, make this sacrifice, and you've got to go through this ceremony, and you've got to be ceremonially clean, and you've got to go through the steps. You can't just go around announcing to people they're forgiven. And Jesus, uh, I love this, Luke tells us that Jesus knows the hearts of men. He knows what's going on. They don't even have to say it. They're just thinking it. So if you ever want to get brought up in a story of Jesus, just think something around him and he'll bring it up. He says this, I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. And then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And the paralyzed man stands up. I'm sure his legs start to wobble a little bit at first. And then he realizes, I have never stood before. He realizes... I'm not only forgiven, but I'm healed. And, and he leaves, and the people are amazed. And this is good news. This is good news for you, and this is good news for me. And do you know what makes this such good news? It's because you've sinned, and I've sinned. That's what makes this such good news. And maybe you don't realize how good this news is, because maybe you don't realize the grip that sin can have on your life. Because when Jesus talks about sin, he talks about this idea that God created us for a specific purpose and for a specific reason, that we were not an accident. And yet, when we sin, we're missing the mark on how God created us to live. And what that does to us is those things then become our captors. We become captive to the things that we've done. We have a new master and Jesus wants to set us free from that because it's not what we were originally created for. And so Jesus comes into the scene and he says, look, you've been held captive by these things. You've sinned and I want to set you free from that. In fact, we often don't even keep our own standards. We fall short of God's standards, but we don't even need a verse to tell us that because you know and I know that you have some standards that you've set for yourself and you don't even keep those standards. And I have some standards I set for myself and I had, I'm not even able to keep my own standards, let alone a holy God's standards. And somewhere along the way, all of us have sinned and we become captive to those things. We've chosen a new master. We've chosen to give ourselves to that. And Jesus comes along and goes, that is not what you were created for. You were not designed for that. You have purpose. You are not an accident. And as a result, we've experienced brokenness between us and God and us and each other. And a big chunk of our lives are spent trying to figure out how to heal that brokenness. A lot of the violence, a lot of the wars, a lot of the greed, a lot of the things that take place in our world that we say that's not right. Those are attempts by human beings to try to navigate a world of brokenness. And Jesus comes onto the scene and goes, I got good news. Your sins are forgiven. Jesus, you can't do that. You can't just go around announcing that. Okay. Now, just so you know that I have the authority to forgive, stand up and walk. And now you know, because I've healed your body, that I also have the ability and the authority to forgive your sins. That is such good news for sinners like you and me. See, the good news is for everybody. It's for everybody. Luke tells us right after this event that Jesus and his disciples, they head out and they're walking along a road and they come to an intersection. And at this intersection, there is a toll booth. Not the toll booth that you and I are used to. The, the toll booth you and I are used to has an arm. It's a wooden arm. This toll booth had like a Roman spear, okay? Everybody pays the fine. And the guy working the toll booth is a guy named Levi. Later on, we come to learn his, his name is Matthew. But Levi, or Matthew, is this tax collector. And he's sitting there, and the only people that tax collectors hang out with is other tax collectors. They are ceremonially unclean. They're outside of anything that God blesses. And that's how it is. And the thought around tax collectors is you better enjoy this life because 
enjoy the wealth, enjoy the prestige, whatever it is that comes with this life, because in the afterlife, it is not going to be good for you. So you better enjoy it now. That was the thought that people had towards tax collectors. And Jesus walks up to Levi, who we know as Matthew, and he says this, follow me and be my disciple. And you can almost picture the faces of Jesus' others, uh, of Jesus' other disciples. And, and they're thinking, Jesus, him? You know what he does, right? You know he's a tax collector. You, you understand what he does for a living. You understand that he works for the Roman Empire and he exploits his own countrymen for his own well-being and his own wealth and gain. You understand that's who he is. He's unclean. He's not fit to go to the temple. He can't follow the law of Moses. He, he's basically a traitor to his own people. You know that, right? And Levi is probably thinking the same thing. Jesus, you know who I am, right? Like, I know who you are. You're a rabbi. You're a teacher. I'm a tax collector. The two of us don't mix. We're like oil and water. In fact, I'm like the sermon illustration in all the other rabbis' sermons. They're like, hey, don't grow up to be like Levi. He's a tax collector. You want me to follow you? Isn't that good news? That's such good news because here's what that means. No matter how far you go, no matter how far you wander, no matter how far you think you are, you can always take a step towards following Jesus. You can always take a step towards following Jesus. And so Jesus says to Levi, yeah, I want you to follow me. Come and follow me. And to everyone's surprise, Levi says, all right, I'm game. Where are we going? And Jesus says, we're going to your house. And again, the other disciples must have been thinking, oh, come on. I mean, it's, he's joining our posse. That's bad enough. But now you're telling us we're going to go to his house? We can't go to his house. If we step foot in his house, we become ceremonially unclean. We're, I mean, that thing's probably filled with tax collector cooties. And we're not going to be able to go to the temple for years, you know? And Jesus says, no, we're going to his house. And when they go to his house, everybody who is there is just like Levi. It's all tax collectors. It's the only people Levi knows. They're all tax collectors. And the Pharisees and the religious leaders, they're following along. They want to see what's going to happen. But they're standing in the cul-de-sac. They don't even want their feet to touch the edge of the lawn. And they send a messenger in because they, they're desperate to know what's going on because they're following Jesus. He's disrupting their order of things. And they want to know what's going on. And so they send a messenger in to find out what's going on. Jesus, what's going on? What are you doing? I mean, you claim to come from God, but you're not hanging out with the godly people. You want to hang out with the godly people, that's out here on the cul-de-sac. We're the ones who are the godly people. And if you claim to come from God, you're supposed to be hanging out with us. And so Jesus sends the messenger back out with this message. Luke records this for us. And again, the same chapter, Luke 5. Healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I've come to call not those who think they are righteous. I've come to call not the people who think they've got it all together and the people who can go through all the steps and jump through all the hoops and check all the boxes and, and the people who just know that they know exactly what to say and when to say it. And they know, you know, the right motions and when to stand and when to sit and the right prayers. Jesus said, I did not come for those people. The healthy don't need a doctor, the sick do. I have come not to call people who think they're righteous, but those who know they are sinners. People who look in their own lives and they go, yeah, I know what I've done is wrong. Have you ever thought about this? Isn't it ironic that people who have stolen from other people don't like to be stolen from? It's ironic, isn't it? People who lie to other people don't like to be lied to. People who have been unfaithful don't like to be cheated on. Why is that? It's because deep down inside of themselves, they know that it's wrong. And this is who Jesus came for. People who know that they are sinners and, he says, need to repent. People who know that they're sinners and need to repent. Repent means I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn and go in an opposite direction. People who know the way that I've been living life, the things that I've been doing, it's not working for me. It's not leading my life to the place I wanted it to go. So I need to take my life in a completely different direction. Those people who know that, they just don't know what direction to go, I came for those people. And folks, that's good news. The good news is that once I've forgiven people, Jesus says, I'm asking them to see themselves and to see God and to see the world in a completely different way. And they're going to see it because once, once they know that God forgives them, regardless of how far away they've been, they're going to be able to forgive themselves. And once they're able to forgive themselves, they're going to see everybody else differently. They're going to see God differently. And they're going to see faith differently. They're going to see themselves differently. And they're going to start to see everybody else differently. They're going to start to see people 
as people who are created in the image of God. They're going to start to see God in them. So this is good news, Jesus would say. See, the original version was difficult to resist. The original version was really difficult to resist. The good news is Jesus didn't just tell his followers to be good. Because if the message of Christianity, if the message of Jesus, if the good news is simply that you need to be good, that's a really easy message to resist. Because you know and I know a lot of Christians who don't be good. And if that's all it is, the second that we have people who claim to be Christians who aren't good, the whole thing falls apart. But Jesus said something different. He said, I want you to live in a completely different way. I, I want you to enter into this, this kingdom of God. And by the way, it's, it's not a physical kingdom. It's a kingdom of the heart. It's a kingdom of the spirit. It's a kingdom of conscience. It's a way of living life that you enter into. And it's here and it's now and you get to be a part of it. And there's no pre-qualifications because everybody's invited. And folks, that is good news that's really difficult to resist. And Jesus says, now that you've experienced this good news, here's what I want you to do. You need to do good. Specifically, he would say this in Luke 6, do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who hurt you. Well, who does that, right? I mean, Jesus would say, you're about to learn something about your heavenly father that nobody has probably ever taught you. So what I want you to do is, I want you to do good, but I want you to do good to people who have hurt you. And I want you to pray for people who hate you. And then he says, if you do good only to those who do good to you, why should you get credit? Even sinners do that much. That's a version of good that's been around for a really long time, Jesus would say. That's a version of good that you're used to. That's a version of good that everybody already knows about. That's not going to change the world. That's not good news. That version of good has been around. And you know that version of good. The version of good that says, I'll be good to you as long as you're good to me. And to the level and to the degree and to the extent that you're good to me, I'll be good to you. And to, to, to the degree that you're not good to me, three snaps in a Z formation, baby. Like, I will not be good to you. Jesus goes, no, th this is something brand new. Love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to be repaid. This is a totally different version of good. And then Jesus said something that caused his audience to probably drop their notebooks, drop their pens, and gasp in astonishment. <clears throat> what Jesus said next, in their minds, if this is true, then this changes everything. What Jesus said next, if this is true, this is the foundation for this truly being really, really good news. Jesus said, love your enemies. Do good to them without expecting anything in return. Do good to people who hate you. Do good to people who have hurt you. Do good to your enemies. Because if you do that, and then he continues, you will truly be acting as children of the Most High. This is the family resemblance, Jesus would say, because that's what your heavenly father is like. In fact, you may have never been introduced to that version. It, you, you may not be have ever been introduced to that version of God. And you might have been introduced to a version of Christianity as a teenager or as a young adult that was completely different than that. But you need to know the original version is very, very difficult to resist. And here's why. Jesus said, you're acting like when you do that, when you do good to people who hurt you, when you do good to people who hate you, when you do good to your enemies who can never repay you, you're acting like your heavenly father. And here's why. For he is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. Jesus says, I'm the exact representation of God. If you want to know what God is like, you look at me. I'm the embodiment of who God is. And this God is good to unthankful and wicked people. And that's good news. Because I've been unthankful. And you've been wicked. <laughs> and I've been wicked and you've been unthankful. And while wicked isn't a word that we use on a day-to-day -day basis to describe the emotions surrounding this, it just means we, we've done things that are not good. And Jesus says, you want to know what makes this good news so good? It's because this God is good to people who aren't good. That's good news because we've been not good. That's what makes it so incredible. I don't know why anybody wouldn't want that to be true, even if they don't believe it yet. 
even if they're not yet convinced that it's true. And if you're still resisting Christianity, if you're here and, and you're still keeping God at arm's distance or you're engaging with us online, you're still keeping God at arm's distance, I totally respect that. That is certainly, uh, you can do that. But I want you to know that the God that you are resisting is the God who is kind to unthankful and wicked people. I want you to know that. And that's coming from the lips of Jesus. And the reason, the reason most people resist the church is because there are so many Christians who are not kind to unthankful and not good people. There are so many Christians who are not kind to people who they deem to be not good. And that's unfortunate. They're thankful that God is kind towards them. They just don't want to extend that same kind of goodness to other people who are not good as well. Why is that? Why is it that our reputation isn't the same as Jesus if we are his followers? I think it comes down to this. Many Christians are content to believe but not follow. Many Christians have become content to believe in Jesus but not actually follow Jesus with the way that they live their life. And folks, believing doesn't make the difference. Following Jesus is what makes all the difference. And when Christians decide not just to believe in Jesus, but to actually follow him with the way that they live their life and put his commands into practice, the result is a version of Christianity that is very, very difficult to resist. And people will want it to be true because they'll see that it's good, even if they're not yet convinced that it's true. And if, if that's you, and maybe you're not ready to believe, I want you to know you can still take a step toward following Jesus because you're invited. And then Jesus said this, you must be compassionate just as your father is compassionate. What's not to love about that? Jesus says, look, this is the God who is kind to the unthankful and the wicked, and I want you to live like that, and I want you to be good to people who aren't good to you. That's a whole new version of good because this is a good God, and he's good to people who aren't good. And in fact, he's compassionate and so I want you to be compassionate because that's who your heavenly father is. And if you grew up on a version of Christianity where God was anything but compassionate, I'm sorry, that wasn't the original version. The original version is good news. Jesus' message is good news for sinners. And it was threatening to the self-righteous. And just so you know, there are no self-righteous followers of Jesus. He didn't leave any room for self-righteousness. He leveled the playing field. At the very beginning, the angel made this announcement. The Savior... Yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And that's good news because we all needed a Savior. And God is addressing our most fundamental need when he sent Jesus into the world. Because we experience brokenness with each other and brokenness with God because we have done things that are not good. And so God sent Jesus into the world and said, this is who God is. He is good. And he's good to people who aren't good. And so all of you who have not been good... This good God will do good to you. And then he took all of our ungood on himself so that we could be reconnected with a good God. That's good news. Jesus is the personification of good. Is Christianity good? Is the message of Jesus good news? Matthew thought it was. He wrote about it. He documented it. Mark thought it was. Luke thought it was. John thought it was. The Apostle Paul eventually thought it was. Peter thought it was. James, the brother of Jesus, thought that it was good news. Many, many others thought so, and they decided to document what they thought because the original version was good news. And when it's presented in its raw form, it's very difficult to resist. So if you're here, if you're engaging with us online, and you just don't buy it, you just, it never sounded good, Maybe you never heard the original version. Maybe you never heard this version in, in its original form. And, and maybe somebody actually misused the version that they were presenting to you. And they used it to make you feel guilty and to oppress you and to make you feel captive to yet another thing. That is not the original version. And if that's you, I'm sorry. But I want you to know that people who were closest to Jesus believed that Jesus was God in human form and that he was good. And that you have been invited because everybody's invited. That's good news. And so if you're here today, I want to encourage you. If you're here, if you're engaging online and you've never said yes to the invitation to be a part of God's family, 
you're invited. The, the message of the scriptures is that God is building a family and he wants you in it. If you've never said yes to that, you don't, there's no prerequisite. There's no classes you have to take. There's no uh, behaviors you have to line up first. You don't have to become ceremonially clean, okay? You have been invited because that is what you were created for. And if you want to say yes, I invite you. And I know you're still going to have some doubts and some struggles and some questions all along the way. And you get to bring those along with you because you've been invited to simply take a step towards following Jesus. That's good news. So if you want to say yes to that, agree with this prayer as we close. God, thank you for sending Jesus into the world with this message of good news. And I pray, forgive my sins. Forgive me for the times where I have walked away from you and where whatever version of you I thought I was walking away from. If the message is truly that Jesus came into the world to set us free and to reunite us with a good God, I want that. And so I pray, adopt me into your family. Make me your son, make me your daughter, and then help me to follow. I got a lot of questions and I got a lot of doubts, but I'm willing to bring that with me and to take a step towards following you. I want it to be true. So help me to follow. And God, for the rest of us, may we not be content to simply believe, but may we follow. May we be good to people that we deem as not good. May we be people who are good to those who are not good to us. May we be good and do good and express this kingdom principle in the world as representatives of you. We commit this to you. We pray this in your name. Amen.